Welcome to another episode of Tour on Air. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jotika Vermani. I hope I got it right. Uh, Executive Director of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Welcome. Thank you, Nico. It's lovely to be here. So the Institute was established in 2009, um, for those who don't know this, by Eric and Wendy Schmidt, um, with the mission to advance oceanographic research through the development of innovative technologies, open sharing of information, and broad communication about ocean health. And probably that latter part um, is what we're serving today um, with this interview. So thanks for taking the time. Um, before we dive into your work, um, I would love to talk to you about what I picked up on your bio that you also produced an award-winning sci-fi short movie and you write a pretty funny tropical storms blog, a humorous tropical storms blog, which I brought through today. Um, so what's the uh, interest in, in storytelling there? Oh, that's a very good question actually. So they're actually, they came about for two different reasons. The um, short film, as you started with that one, and my husband is actually uh, a movie uh, filmmaker. And so he had asked me if I would produce this short film for him. It's a science fiction short called Hashtag, because um, the work I was doing in managing science projects translates very much to the movie making industry. It's just the jargon is different, the language is different, but there's a lot of similarities. And so I thought, why not? I will try it. And so I did. And uh, it was a really good experience. And in what way would you say does it translate? Is it a question of um, presenting data or synthesizing information, um, being organized in managing you know, sort of the it, communication of scientific results? Or It is. It's, it's all of that. But it's also... Um, the creation of something from scratch. Uh, so it's like, so I was working at XPRIZE at the time uh, and XPRIZE is a, a nonprofit where we run large international competitions for technology development. Um, and the scale of those competitions, it was creating an experiment mm -hmm. to test technology from scratch on a scale that's never been done before. Uh, and that's like a film, you know, you have it in writing what the script is like, and then you have to pull together all the elements, the producer, the director together work, pulling in the actors, pulling in the uh, location, the costume. So it's really, there's a similarity in uh, creating and uh, executing on an experiment or a technology test bed or a test field and a movie so so there's that aspect to it as well it's uh, it's but in addition to that it is the the journey i i think is is also there it's a piece of paper in both cases to start with and at the end you have either hardware or data or results or a movie what a about, lot of similarities. What about sort of having um, a narrative? I mean, is that something that for you in the scientific uh, work that you do, is that something that you aim for? Like, you know, having sort of a subjective, you know, while obviously being, you know, sort of scientifically objective, um, but, you know, are you trying to find data that supports maybe a certain narrative that, that, that you're looking for? When I went on the website actually of the Institute, um, I, I that was a thought that I had when I read through the information and how you compiled the information that there was, you know, and excuse me, like if maybe I, I have misread, but like I, I didn't find as much of a kind of narrative of why that work was being done. Um, sure. It, it was in a way very scientific in this in the in the sense of like let's gather data let's present data in an open transparent way and i was like well what's the end goal is it you know sustainability sure. is it fighting the climate crisis or sure yeah so so uh it is very scientific so the schmidt ocean institute is very focused on the science side mm -hmm. of this um and scientifically you you know you have a hypothesis and so the narrative stems from that hypothesis and whether it's correct or not in, in 
in general scientific terms. For the Schmidt Ocean Institute, um, one of our key um, missions is to explore the oceans. And part of the narrative there in, in the language that you've just used is um, the ocean covers 71% of our planet. And we really don't know what's out there, what the seafloor looks like, mm -hmm. what creatures are out there. Um, so our understanding of the ocean is quite poor, mm -hmm. really. And um, when you start to understand something, that's when you start to put a value on it. Mm -hmm. and, and once you start to put some value on it, whatever that means to you, mm -hmm. like uh, it could be uh, personal value, emotional value, it could be financial value. Once you've put that mm -hmm. value on it is when you start to look after it and care for it. Mm -hmm. So the actual narrative flow, we, we focus very much on the understanding piece as mm -hmm. a, a foundational piece to mm -hmm. the narrative, which ultimately leads to the care and well-being of the ocean. And the more that you understand, uh, you know, of it or about it, like it has that, you know, throughout the years, then sort of uh, altered your, um, let's say, you know, wishes, goals, desires on, you know, what to do, because I could imagine there's so many angles that you could go down, right? Like so many yes. aspects of going deeper, digging deeper into understanding particular parts of the work that you do. Like, how has that kind of changed? And what's your current focus where you say, this is, you know, where we really want to uh, dive deeper and, and why? Yeah, so there is uh, a change because the more you find out, the more kind of you realize the less you know in a way mm -hmm. uh, and the more there is to find out. Um, but it's not just about the finding out. It's about the tools that we have at our fingertips that help us to find out. So... Mm -hmm. You know, you, you may want to find certain things, but the tools may not yet exist. So mm -hmm. there is a temporal aspect to that as well. But I think um, for us, it's uh, the focus of um, exploring the unknown, the deep sea, the parts of the world that are really hard to get to mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of shed light on what's out there. Um, because like I said, without knowing what's out there, it's really hard to say, um, this is what to preserve, or this is the impact that this is having, or the change that we're creating is having mm -hmm. out there. Um, so, so it's kind of an interwoven story, the, ho the whole thing. It's really uh, bringing that out for everyone to act on uh, mm -hmm. and to respond to. Uh, so that's where we see ourselves is this broader uh, uh, piece uh, of the puzzle and then others can continue that story mm -hmm. I mean speaking of like this uh, you know storytelling and and kind of finding a narrative and you know you said you know you, you have a hypothesis but I, I'm sure you know there's a lot of hypotheses that you have and then you still need to make that decision on what resources what, areas. what area mm -hmm. you, you will deploy your yeah. resources on yeah. Um, I, I, I just watched uh, Seaspiracy, like many, many other. Uh, <laughs> what did you think of the, the movie and, and its way of um, sort of presenting uh, data? Um, and, and <laughs> so uh, I, I have to say, yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that, but um, so I can't actually directly comment on yeah. that myself yet yeah but for us um we're looking at um so we do have very definitive things that we're going to focus on yeah. like you said the ocean is so vast there's so many things to do uh one of them is uh for example mapping the seafloor mm -hmm. so uh right now about 20 percent of the seafloor has been mapped to mm -hmm. high resolution which means that most of our world is still unmapped we know Mars better than we know our planet here. Um, and there is now this goal, Seabed 2030, to have a high resolution map of the entire seafloor by mm -hmm. 2030, which is incredible because then that means by 2030, we will know where all the um, sea mounts are, where um, the um, vol underwater volcanoes are. We may know where the shipwrecks are. We'll have a, a 
geographical understanding of where things are. Mm -hmm. That's the seafloor. So that's one thing that we're going to be, uh, you know, really pushing. And we have done a lot of mapping of the seafloor. We've done over a million square kilometers in the time, you know, we've been um, operational. But um, another area is uh, to um, allow, uh, to, to look at biodiversity. So there is a lot of marine life. They're like mm -hmm. aliens of of our own planet that we still don't know. Um, so last year, for example, we continued operations around Australia and we found um, serendipitously the longest sea creature, 100 and, about 150 feet in length, you know, it's a very long thing. Um, never been seen before till last year, 2020. Uh, wow. But, and so- Did it have a name imagine, before or? Uh, it's a siphonophore, so we yeah. know what kind of creature it is, but something of this length had never been seen before. And that goes back to that technology piece. The ocean is really hard mm -hmm. to operate in and to look into. Um, but we had the right technology and we happened to be in the right place at the right, right time. But it really shows that this is just 2020. How much more is out there that we don't know? How many more creatures are out there and what sizes are they? Um, so biodiversity is a big piece of our mm -hmm. focus as well. So it's not just then a, a seafloor map. It's essentially a map, if you like, of the three-dimensional living space of the mm -hmm. ocean. The ocean is, you know, it covers something like 95% of all living space on planet Earth, most of which we've not yet looked into. So Biodiversity is another piece of what we're looking at. We're, uh, we're continuing with all of our deep sea. So we have capabilities mm -hmm. to do a lot of deep sea work. Mm -hmm. So focusing on that. Um, and then also looking at, um, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with scientists who are looking at um, the carbon cycle and nutrient cycle and, uh, and the ocean health in general. Yeah. Uh, so there's a number of different areas that we we look at and and from like the examples that you just mentioned also from um, mapping the the seafloor like how dire is the situation um at the moment like seafloor mapping so uh, to, to give an example of why this is such a big deal now um there was i don't know if you remember back in 2012 there was a malaysian airline that mm -hmm. uh, vanished um and there was a long search for it. Mm -hmm. And during the process of that search, this is, you know, it, it vanished in 2012. Um, they found two new volcanoes, one of which was bigger than Mount Vesuvius. So uh, until, until then, we didn't even know that existed on this planet. Um, so right now, the resolution for, if you look on, you know, Google Maps or something, you'll see, you can see a map of the ocean floor and you'd think, Oh, it's already been mapped. Actually, that's a, like a one kilometer resolution. So that means that from where you're standing for one kilometer in every direction, well, wow. what you see right now is what you would see. So if you were um, on the third floor of a building for one kilometer around you, it would be the third floor of a building. There'd be no roads, no trees, no other buildings. Uh, and we're aiming now for something like a hundred meter resolution, at least, so we can get to see some of those finer scale details. Incredible. And in, in when you look at those images and the research that you do, I mean, a, a big theme of the con uh, Seaspiracy movie um, was around, you know, the destruction of the sea floors with, um, you know, commercial fishing tanks and, and the big nets um, that are used for fishing. And, and I, I didn't write down the exact number I should have but like how many you know hundreds of thousands of football fields um, are being destroyed um, with with commercial shipping like what is the health status of the seafloor when you see that like how dire or shocking is is the situation in 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 reality um so I don't uh, the ocean I mean it's such a vast space mm -hmm. that I think that's one thing that people grasp and, and struggle with is how big is this space that we're actually looking at 
Uh, but I don't think uh, fisheries is the only issue that we're mm -hmm. facing for the ocean. There are other issues, of course. So, um, for example, we know, uh, of course, uh, in the atmosphere, the CO2 levels are increasing and the ocean is taking that up uh, and absorbing some of that. So there's uh, big issues that are brewing and connected with ocean acidification, which is that uptake of CO2. Um, uh, there's also deoxygenation. So that's, uh, you know, the reduction of oxygen in the ocean mm -hmm. uh, is slowly happening. Um, there's plastics. Now that's another big topic. Whenever we go out um, uh, with our um, ROV, our remotely operated mm -hmm. ve vehicle, it's an underwater robot can go down to 4,500 meter depth. Uh, even when we're in pristine areas that have never been seen before, uh, every once in a while, there'll be a piece of plastic, a plastic bag or a balloon mm -hmm. that we pick up and bring back. And there's, so the human footprint, uh, I mean, the, the sea floor, the, the places we've gone down on are beautiful and untouched um, and, you know, places of, of uh, natural beauty and wildlife. And you go down like 10,000 meters, you're going down all the way, uh, right? Uh, Sometimes, it depends. Yeah. Um, to, uh, yeah, it really depends. We can go down to 4,500 meters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so not 10,000, but 4,500. Mm -hmm. but, um, but then, you know, then you'll turn a corner and there'll be this plastic bag that shouldn't be there because nobody has ever been there before and yet it's found its way there so so I think there's a lot of um, uh, things that are impacting the ocean however um, I think there's also a lot of people who are looking at what are the solutions and how can we turn this around and how can we make this a healthy place for all yeah. of us and I mean, sorry, last question on this uh, conspiracy, and then I let you watch it. And, oh, okay. uh, and maybe, maybe <laughs> okay. you know, I, I don't want to give give it all away. Uh, but uh, the whole premise of, of the movie, the central piece is that, you know, this, uh, you know, question of what can we do that, you know, sort of this, you know, big, quick, in theory, quick win out there would be uh, to stop commercial fishing, um, which mm. obviously would have, you know, huge impacts on on sort of the social, um, you know, dimension uh, and, and uh, you know, the jobs that are related to, to the fishing, but that actually more than 50% of the plastic in the ocean is from commercial fishing nets. Um, and that that would be, you know, a, a huge uh, win, actually, for the ocean and thereby uh, for humanity. And that is apparently something that is not very prominently called for among um, the community of, of uh, scientists. And I don't know if, you know, I, I wonder like, what's your take on that? Like why that so, is not being addressed or being called for? So, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I think, um, you know, for fishing, mm -hmm. the, like fish, fishing sustains, um, I think it's like a third of all. I mean, it, it provides uh, protein yeah. for a large portion of our population. So, mm. really, it's a, a you have to also balance that against yeah. it. Uh, and I'm all for sustainable fishing practices, and um, there are um, efforts underway to clean up the fishing gear and the yeah. fishing nets. Um, and so, really, we have to look at everything holistically it's kind yeah. of actually like it's kind of like the virus that we're currently yeah. dealing with the pandemic right it's not just uh, a one yeah. one stop thing it's it's repercussions have been economic uh they've caused hardship in many many other ways yeah um but is but that think, enough um, you think, I think yeah I, I mean oh. not you know just in general maybe like as a as a scientist do you think you know, irrespective of commercial fishing, but do you really think that, you know, by not having very drastic policy decisions, um, you know, geared at solving the climate crisis or really tackling the climate crisis, um, we are just going, you know, with sort of full speed uh, yeah, to, I, to a disaster that is just 
about to happen? So like, I think there's enough. Mm. Yeah, I think there's enough. Um, you know, evidence to have some policy decisions made. I think yep. um, what uh, what I would caution is, you know, not doing one drastic thing and then having mm. to do something even more drastic when in, you know, after you've made one change, 10 years later, you found out the repercussions from that one change made it worse. Mm. So really thinking through uh, forward looking, if we make this change, what are the knock on effects yep. from this change? And how does it impact everything? It's every, we're all connected, right? So how does it impact everything? Um, and, I, you know, I, I look at plastics as an example of that. So 60 years ago, 70 years ago, when this new material called plastics was was created and came into existence, and everyone went, this is amazing stuff, we don't need uh, you know, these heavy uh, metal or, or glass containers that keep breaking. This plastic is amazing. We're using it in everything. And now 60, 70 years later, we're like, oh, this was a, not a great idea. It's very versatile, but there's an issue. Yeah. So I really think, um, you know, let's, let's consider what we're doing. And when we we've got enough evidence to make change. We, mm. we know we live on one planet. There's only this many resources on this planet. We need to be careful of how we use them. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, don't be wasteful. Um, and I think, you know, going back to uh, the fisheries issue, for example, uh, and weaving that into what I mentioned earlier about solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so there are things, you know, like um, they're starting on, um, uh, well, there's aquaculture, but there's also, you know, so fish farming, yep. deliberate fish farming. Um, and there's also lab grown uh, uh, technologies that are starting up uh, uh, to come into being as well. So beyond fish yeah <laughs> exactly beyond i don't know but um so i think you know there's there's things that are happening that are, cr are creating that slowly but surely uh heading in that direction of of creating the change that we want we want to see same same for plastics right there's uh there are efforts underway on uh new materials and recycling and cleaning up the ocean stopping it getting in in the first place mm. But you kind of see hope in the next generation, you know, um, I mean, in Europe, the uh, climate activist uh, groups, you know, have been very loud and, and the school strikes Friday for Future that we mm -hmm. had, I, I think they never really picked up as much uh, steam in the US, but in Europe, this was really a very, or is it, it's a very powerful movement. Do you, do you feel like, you know, they, they get it like they, they finally wake up or, you know, that next generation is not just going to, you know, spend decades of, you know, not really tackling the, uh, the issues heads on. Um, no, I think, I think things are changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's great what the, the awareness has been that, mm -hmm. you know, did stem out of there. But I think globally, there's a huge shift happening right now that I've not seen before, uh, yeah. as far as this topic is concerned. Um, I think, uh, you know, we're heading into COP26. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of movement and momentum around this topic. Uh, leadership uh, of all ages not just the youth but all true ages. i didn't want to be ageist <laughs> i have but enough gray hair you know to be <laughs> yes. but they're um you know they're sitting up and they're taking notice and even um i think even industry yep is starting to make a change and every day we hear more about renewables i mean over in europe you're doing yep. a great job with renewable energy as a replacement now so um, in, in various countries, so uh, actually Germany included, right? So yeah. Well, um, and we may something. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, fifteen years ago, it wasn't even really talk, implemented or talked about as much as it is now. So I think we're yeah. really seeing this change happening. 
I, I, I think so too. And I, I hope it will, you know, ultimately uh, lead to policy changes because uh, I'm not so optimistic that, you know, the, the current political system will really do, you know, the changes required. But I think the political system is going to change, like those in power will lose power. Um, and, and we're seeing it happening in Germany. I don't know if you follow, but we have an election uh, going on this year. Um, and it looks like the Green Party could actually um, have the chancellery, um, which is like incredible. Like 10 years ago, if you would have told this to anybody, like it, it was just so far removed from something that could be even considered possible. And, and now we're very, very close. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's what's happening because the young are just voting those out mm -hmm. um, who are not making uh, the required changes. So let's see, because ultimately, you know, it can only happen, of course, on a policy level, um, you know, really big impact. Well, um, I think um, it, it is policy, Nika, but I think it's also economics. So as we make different choices of mm -hmm. where we want to spend money. Mm -hmm. um, as a consumer? Saying, or, you know, as a mm -hmm. consumer, yeah, yeah, as a consumer, that's where, mm -hmm. you know, you see businesses sure. sit up and start to take note that mm -hmm. this is not the future for our business. Uh, and if we want to survive as a business, we have to shift as well. Mm, totally. So even even without necessarily the policy piece, um, I think change is happening. Do you think that uh, the corona uh, pandemic, the COVID pandemic has uh, not only heightened the interest in scientific work, but... Um, you know, also maybe led to the belief among governments around the world that a cooperation on large scale projects is uh, possible. Um, and also that, you know, the population is willing uh, to, um, I guess, trade in some of, I wouldn't say, you know, personal freedoms necessarily, but some of their maybe comfort or general practice and style of living um, for the greater good and, and to really tackle these big uh, challenges that we're facing as humanity? That's a really good question. And I really hope the coronavirus has led to more awareness of science in general um, uh, and the importance of science. I mean, uh, really, I think, I think people have learned a lot this year, scientifically speaking, uh, and looking at data and numbers and trying mm -hmm. to get to, you know, uh, grips with what what it means what it all means mm -hmm. um, my hope is it translates to some of the longer term things that we're facing um, and there's not just a a small blip in our existence here because and I've said this before but um, you know imagine if we knew um, 10 years ago that this year we would have a pandemic what actions, or even three years ago, what actions would we all have done, whether that's individual on a, a business or government level, what would we have done? So to me, this is how it ties into climate. We know the data, we know we have to stop temperature from rising um, because of its longer term implications. And so we have, you know, we have a very narrow window of a few years to sort this out. Can we do something now instead of waiting <laughs> until it's almost too late? So I really hope that uh, it's shown, you know, the importance of science um, to our daily existence and not mm -hmm. just science as an afterthought, mm -hmm. but um, it, its impact on the economy and its impact on our society and on our loved ones and mm -hmm. on our normal way of life and, and everything. Um, and I also hope it's shown, uh, you know, we do need us every once in a while to tackle some things as, an, as a world, not country by country or individually by individually. There are needs for coordinated action on certain items um, for survival, not just of humans, but of everyone, everything on this planet. And I hope that, you know, the, the COP26 and all future such sh yeah. are, are heading in that direction. And what about sort of, you know, just to close the loop, maybe to what we started speaking about in terms of narrative and, and 
um, you know, communication around scientific progress. It also seems to me, I mean, with, with COVID, it seemed so clear in a way, right? Like it, it's, it's almost, you know, you know, fairly simple to grasp. Um, right? There's a virus. We know now how it spreads, how it doesn't spread. Um, we know what helps uh, against the spread of the virus. Um, and still, you know, we, we see a lot of um, sort of counter reaction to what seems to be, you know, very clear and sensible to do, um, or misunderstanding, um, or disinterest, or disinformation, misinformation. Um, and then if you talk about the climate, it becomes, you know, it can become very complex very fast. Mm -hmm. And then if you go down to the ocean and, you know, reading your website and I was like, oh, wow, like that's, that's just complicated uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, what, what efforts do you think are, are necessary to, um, you know, get like the whole world behind uh, the work that, uh, that you do? I think um, so this comes back to what you were pushing on at the very beginning of this, which is that storytelling and the ability to convey uh, to the public a, a logical, consistent story mm -hmm. and message that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, what the world saw in this last year was, you know, the uncertainty that is around science as it happens. Yeah. And this is, you know, it's par for course with scientific uh, research is you try something and it doesn't yeah. necessarily work and you don't have 100%, you know, this is this is yeah. how it's going to be because that's part of the exploration. That's kind mm -hmm. of what we're doing. Um, but I think it's conveying that consistent message, staying on target. I actually also think, uh, at least for the ocean, um, you know, we have to have some optimism and some hope. Uh, without hope, there isn't much, you know, it's like, why are we doing this? So I think making sure, yes, you know, acknowledging there are things that are going wrong, but also um, what is beautiful and inspirational and why is it worth keeping? And um, all of that has to be told and it has to be told really strongly. And I think that's what we try and do to, you know, with the, with showing what's down there. Uh, you know, you can get onto our Schmidt Ocean Institute uh, YouTube channel and mm -hmm. we broadcast live from the deep sea. And in fact, we're right now off Australia. Doing that. Yeah. Exactly that, Amazing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you are there with the scientists as they look and see something new and they're narrating and it's discovering with them the beauty of our own natural world, which mm -hmm. I think people tend to forget uh, uh, every once in a while, maybe, maybe not, maybe this year it's changed everything. But, but I think that hopeful wonder, wonder that you have yeah. is, is still necessary. And on the closing note, you know, this is a good closing note to speak about things that make you hopeful. Like, are there some concrete examples of things that you discovered or things that may be in the pipeline in terms of technology that you're really excited about um, to be using um, for your work and maybe then to kind of close on a broader, you know, idea around sort of, you know, exponential technology development. Like, is that something that you as a scientist, you know, in the trenches really believe in, in the sense that, you know, we will have technology that will prevent us from total collapse. Uh, yes, there's a lot. <laughs> I have a lot to answer to the, these this whole stream <laughs> of questions. So, uh, so you know, your first one was there anything hopeful? So, um, actually, last year, a concrete example. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we dove on the Great Barrier Reef mm -hmm. on the northern edges, and we found a new coral reef that had never been discovered before you know and most people think oh the great barrier reef everyone knows what's there it's so well known so to find a new coral reef that was over 500 meters tall from base to top was amazing but what was really great was we actually had the rov dive on it and it was a beautiful vibrant healthy reef uh, and earlier last year you know there was 
um, uh, discussions of how the Great Barrier Reef was struggling in terms of health. So to find this like very vibrant, healthy reef was was just so wonderful and hopeful. Uh, as far as technology, I think um, so. I was uh, I actually led the Ocean Discovery X Prize, uh, which was for exponential technology development. Uh, and we launched that in uh, 2015, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of 2015. And back then, the estimate of mapping the seafloor was 200 to 600 years. We would not know with the technology, you know, that we had that it would take 200 to six, it would take 200 to 600 years. We would never know what our planet looked like. Now we're on this coordinated global effort going back to the you know international cooperation that you're talking about earlier um to map the seafloor in our own lifetimes in 10 years we're on track to do that back in 2015 about five percent had been uh, we'd had a good map of five percent we're at 20 percent now so i really think I've, I've lived through and seen this exponential change in technology and what's great about that kind of technology is uh, it allows us to scale up and to see the ocean, you know, faster than we've ever done before. Um, so, yes, I think there's hope for exponential technology. The bit, you know, the, the piece that I think we still need to lock down is how do we keep the temperature of our planet stable or cool long enough for us to clear and uh, clear the atmosphere? But as far as technology change, you know, there's technology now that's being developed to take CO2 and make that into an economically valuable product. So you can then start to say stop pollution because you need, you know, you're throwing money into the atmosphere, literally. Um, so, you know, there's a company that's now turning it into vodka. Uh, another one that makes concrete, uh, you know, other things that are useful. So I think, um, yeah, I think there's a, a hope in the technology. And I think also there's hope in the people behind the technology, because you need to have that ingenuity. That's a, that is almost a great closing uh, quote. I should probably leave it at that. But I have a question that I ask everybody um, who's who's on the show. And, and that's sort of, it's something that startups uh, I think struggle a lot with or also spend a lot of time and resources on and that is often make or break for a startup company and that's the idea of um, you know whether to pivot so you know really go down a totally different track with an idea or a product um, or whether to go for more incremental um, improvement mm. um, and and the question that I ask everybody on the show is you know whether they experience this similar question in their career and um, whether there are any sort of mental exercises, frameworks, um, or just simple learnings um, in having, you know, sort of done these type of decisions in one's career? Yeah, um, I think uh, I look back at where I, you know, I feel like I've had a lot of pivots, mm -hmm. big pivots, and a lot of them have not been you know, they've been in response to versus like, oh, I thought this is what I would be doing and, and uh, pivoting to that. Um, so I think um, to, uh, being flexible, but also knowing when you're facing a pivot that it looks like um, a mountain in front of you. Mm -hmm. And if you treat it all in one go, like try and consider everything in one go, you're not gonna get anywhere, break it down into smaller manageable pieces mm -hmm. so i like to have maybe a clear end goal so even as a startup or even personally mm -hmm. uh, this year what is my goal uh, and it might be really audacious so aim high i like to aim high um, because and then take steps towards it even if you don't make it all the mm -hmm. way there you're halfway up the mountain right and and that's great so you write that down that answers... at the beginning of the year? Is that an exercise that you do? Oh, I yeah, I do myself. Yep. Like, uh, yeah, uh, every year I do for myself. But I think, uh, you know, having clear goals and then uh, how do you get to those goals? And, and 
uh, it may seem unachievable when you do it, when you write it down at the beginning and then you just chip away, but at least you know the path you're going on. And I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, totally. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. There, there, there is no uh, given answer. Like, it's, you know, it's really interesting. I can, maybe eventually I'll, I'll cut that all together into like one episode or book or something on everybody on the show has been talking about it. So thank you very much for sharing that. Right, Just, I'll read it. Finally, <laughs> it, and thank you. Finally, um, the, any resources, uh, books uh, for people that want to dive deeper uh, into everything around ocean health um, that you can recommend? Yeah, we uh, so we have a very robust uh, outreach and communications from mm -hmm. the Schmidt Ocean Institute alone. So uh, we have um, we're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we do broadcast all of our ROV dives live mm -hmm. uh, from the deep sea. So uh, we broadcast when we're going to say show them on social media. But um, you can go to our YouTube channel, Schmidt Ocean. Um, dot org uh, in our YouTube channel uh, and we have an archive of all of our videos on there as well so there's a wealth of information and interviews and um, we had a symposium in February and all of those panels and discussions are on there too so we'd love to have you join us on this uh, and the other thing we do actually is an artist at sea program so mm. we actually also have a collection of art that we're uh, happy to put up in our exhibits around the world. So if anyone would like an, an ocean themed art exhibit near them, just reach out to us. Very cool. Great idea. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jotika Virmani, um, for joining us today and best of luck with uh, your mission. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure.